Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Futurati podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. I'm sure, like me, you found yourself lying on your back, looking up at the night sky spangled with stars, wondering at the immensity of the universe and the mysteries it contains. If so, then you're in for a treat, because tonight we're joined by Sarah Crudis. Sarah is a space journalist, international TV host, and award-winning author. She has an academic background in astrophysics and is a global thought leader in the growing commercial space sector. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode, leave it a review, and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Sarah, it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you. Hi, thank you for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Oh, oh, that's a a three-pronged question. So my um, background's in astrophysics. Um, at the Green Masters level, looking at AGN detection and then in broadcast journalism. I used to work with the BBC as a presenter and then a, a science correspondent. And now I work half within the commercial space sector. So with organisations such as Space for Humanity, which is actually Denver-based, uh, which is looking at um, sending people from all kinds of backgrounds up into space. Uh, and then half in the media industry, so hosting television shows, hosting my own podcasts, and writing books about space and generally talking a lot about space and TV. And I don't know if there's a, there's a hard problem so much that I, I, I deal with, but more it's about, I guess the hard problem is actually getting people from all kinds of backgrounds interested in space because so often we talk about inspiring young people inspiring children but we don't talk about inspiring the 60 year olds from arkansas or the 66 year olds from kansas you know what i mean space needs if we're to succeed in exploring space if we're to succeed in pushing the boundaries of what we can do beyond earth then everybody needs to be on board and by everyone i mean not just inspiring children that's important because they're the generation which will build the future but inspiring people from all kinds of backgrounds so that's the the hard problem which i deal with is convincing people who might not think that space relates to them that space particularly this new era in commercial space exploration you know has not only got the ability to shape their future but has already defined their today I'm actually from Arkansas originally, and I can tell you that there was at least one one six year old in Arkansas that was very fascinated by space and inspired by it. Um, so, what what are the efforts around trying to garner interest among broad swaths of people look like? What 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 are the ways in which you you try to do that? And I, I don't just mean writing books. I mean you kind of mentioned that, but is there a particular approach you try to take to kindling an interest in this enterprise? The the idea that there's this final frontier and we could go to it. Uh, how how do you sort of light that fire so for me I, I see space you know space has been something that i've been interested in since i was a little girl I, you know one of my first memories is of looking up at the moon at the night sky i can't remember a time when space hasn't been my passion but for me space exploration and, and questions about the universe so i'll include you know astronomy astrophysics physics all of that in there it's as much sure. about philosophy as it is about science it's about a search for meaning and i don't care where you come from or who you are all of us at some point in our lives would have looked up at the night sky and looked up at the night sky and wondered what else is out there you know what it is that we're a part of and that search for meaning so it's about helping to ignite that childlike curiosity that we've all got but many of us lose as we get become adults and get caught up in day-to-day life so it's about um understanding people where they are in their life and and then trying to to relate that inspiration that wonder that awe, and most importantly that meaning that comes from space exploration back to people from all different walks of lives and i I remember back in 2019 i was uh working in uganda in rather remote parts of uganda and the, the piece i was working on was nothing to do with space it was a journalism piece which is yet to come out yet because of the pandemic but um some of the people i i was working with they were 
from really poor backgrounds. They grew up with nothing in rural parts of Uganda. And yet one thing they did have was the night sky. They grew up under the stars because, of course, in rural Uganda, you don't really have that much in the way of streetlights. So they right. grew up with an appreciation for space that you might not realize. And he's, here were these people that I was there to interview about some really horrific stories and really horrific experiences they had been through. But they all understood space. They all looked up at the stars. They all understood the wonder of space. And they all had an appreciation for how space was shaping their lives, the possibility that, that satellite technology could bring in terms of benefits in their lives back in rural Uganda. So it's all about meeting people in their home environment and, and really listening to them because most people have questions about space. Most people have curiosity about space. And so often we hear, you know, space doesn't benefit people. Space, you know, you know what about people starving in Africa is the cliche line. But actually those people from those poorer communities, from those remote communities already have an appreciation for space. And it's just about harnessing that and, and you know, listening to their questions and, and the, the curiosity that they have. I like that reply. I'm a big believer in the idea that just by virtue of being human, certain sorts of questions tend to preoccupy us. And as long as you have a view of this immensity in the form of the stars, it naturally sparks questions and curiosity. It's almost impossible to stop. And so it's not, not so much a matter, if I read you correctly, it's not so much a matter of kindling anything. It's mostly just removing the layers that have covered what's already there. Do I, do I have that right? Yeah, absolutely correct. I think all of us at some point have that curiosity. It's like, you know, two things kids love learning about are space and dinosaurs, let's be honest. Yep. Um, why hasn't someone written the space dinosaur book yet? Um, you know, but at some point we get sidetracked. We all get sidetracked by life and responsibilities and bills. But it's about, yeah, rekindling that, that inspiration, that fire that so many people have and that curiosity because, you know, the one thing, I wrote a book which um, came out during the pandemic um, called Look Up Our Story with Stars. It has a forward by Michael Collins. And, and the reason I called that book, um, Michael Collins is the Apollo 11 of fame. Um, but the, the reason that I chose Look Up for that book and kind of one of the opening sentences in that book is how, you know, the one thing you have in common, pretty much all of us have in common with our ancestors, whether you go back 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, whatever, is that you, like them, looked up at the stars all of us at some point in our lives have looked up and wondered and it's about you know retaining that urge that curiosity that we've all had because i don't care if you say you don't like look space like space you've still looked up you still have that fascination that wonder and that awe at some point in your life yeah you, you have to be kind of dead inside to not feel that and i'm curious as to whether or not you have a favorite or maybe a small number of favorite instances in which you saw that curiosity come to life. You, you've been a space journalist for a very long time. You've written these books and you've got this podcast. So you've had the chance to interact with a lot of different people and and just see them grapple with this these, these questions. And so I wonder if any of them stick out in your mind, any of those episodes. Yeah, that, that, is, a, that is a great question and something I, I've never actually been asked before, so it's making me pause and think. I think for me, <laughs> um, you know, one thing, it's not a specific thing, but one thing I always um, say to people when I give talks uh, and you always get a good response from that is that, you know, we already live in the space age. All of us carry a space receiver in our pocket, you know, the cell phone that is in your right. pocket or by your side or in your purse or in your backpack is a space receiver. You want to call an Uber or a Lyft. You want to, you know, get a car to come and collect. You want to get food to come to your house. You use that space receiver in your pocket. So, um, you know, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think, I'm sure it'll come to me in a few moments. But, um, you know, that for me is, is one that people don't necessarily realize. So my podcast, uh, Where's Your Jetpack, is actually all about exploring the space age technology that never was and whether we'll get it. So things like jetpacks, flying cars, um, mining in space, um, new planetary homes, you name it. And, and I think so many people, particularly those of a certain age who perhaps a child in the 60s, for example, they're rather disappointed. They don't think we've got the space age that we were told we were going to have by the year 2022. We don't have all these space age s contraptions. We jumped into cyberspace instead of right. outer space. But actually, we use space in our everyday lives. And instead of space being something you know, which is pushing the limits of where humans can go, which will happen eventually, what space has become more and more about is about utilizing that vantage point to benefit life on Earth. So for me, the best kind of responses I've had to inspiring people about space is when you show them how it relates to the mundane things in life and, and how you can't imagine a day without faith. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question or a really interesting reply. So we, I think there, we have a tendency to just sort of treat the advances that we use every day and upon which our lives depend as being very banal and kind of uninspiring. But it's easy to forget that that involves so much space-based technology and it's just a marvel compared to what came before it. And so I, I find that a really compelling point and I'd never really uh, thought of it in the, those terms that we currently live in the space age. Like right now we are in a space age and perhaps it's not as grand as, as what they promised us in the sixties and seventies, but nevertheless it, we were reaping huge benefits from our initial forays into space, however timid they've been so far. Exactly. And perhaps we just got the timing wrong. Just because those things happened, you know, haven't happened right away doesn't mean that they're not going to happen. And this is something I explore in my podcast, Where's My Jetpack? Um, you know, we, we've got all these, these other things instead of what we're doing in space is nothing new. You know, you look at the history of exploration on Earth, for better and for worse. We've got to remember we didn't do everything right. But governments right. went first and, and private industry followed. And we're seeing exactly the same in space. And private industry can take risks, both financial and also attitudes towards um, life in a way that governments cannot. So what we're going to see is changes happening much faster than you realize. And actually, not only are we living in this kind of secret space age that many people don't realize we're living in, but the space age people were promised back in the 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, it's closer than you realize. Change is happening much faster than you realize. And actually, um, one of my favorite quotes is actually from an evolutionary biologist called JBS whole day. Now, and I'll paraphrase it slightly, but it's the universe is not only as strange as you can imagine, but it's stranger than you can imagine. And I like to use that when thinking about, you know, our space future in that we can't even begin to imagine what's to come over the next few decades. If you look back to the year 1900 and, and what someone born in the year 1900 would have seen in their lifetime, say they lived a hundred years, you know, birth of flight, two world wars, um, aviation flying across the Atlantic, humans going to space, humans going to the surface of the moon, then the world of cyberspace. We, uh, no one could have imagined that. The year 2000 was science fiction compared to the year 1900. And the same is true with what's happening now. We cannot imagine what is going to come into, we can make predictions, but we can't imagine what is to come over the next few decades in terms of successes in space exploration and then the benefits that that will bring for us. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I like that quote as well. The the universe isn't just stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. But you and I both have futurist oriented podcasts. So why don't we just try to imagine? So uh, <laughs> you, you think you, you think a lot about what the ensuing decades might entail in terms of our exploration of space and the technologies that might result from that. So why don't you just paint as fantastical a picture as you like about where you think this industry is going? I think this industry is you know, space is no longer going to become a place to go, but space is becoming an extension of life on Earth. We, we, you know, we don't talk about the land industry or the sea industry. It's all part of life on Earth. And what we're going to see is more and more humans in space, more and more humans doing everyday mundane things in space. And, you know, I want to see baristas on the moon and people working everyday jobs on the surface of the moon, because if we're going to succeed in leaving Earth and, you know, this... The, we think Earth is huge and, and exciting and vast and full of wonders, but actually it's but a speck in the ocean compared to the grandness of the universe. So if we're going to take those first steps, we need to extend human presence. So what I hope we see by the end of this um, this century, so let's say the year 2100, um, is that we'll see humans working regular jobs in space. We'll see people born in space, perhaps. We'll see people growing food in space, the only which is a big problem to crack right now. Of course, we hopefully see human beings on Mars and, and perhaps exploring more and more of our solar system. But for me, what's really exciting is that space will one day, and I look forward to this day, become mundane. We're already seeing more and more rocket launches. But just imagine how most people don't get excited about seeing an aeroplane take off and we could one day get to that point where people go into space. It's just something normal, just something many, many people do. It's just an extension of humanity's presence. And that, for me, is my prediction of the future. Certainly near space and you know, Earth orbit, the moon, will become mundane. It will just become part of what humans can do, where, where the human experience can be. And then our focus will be on exploring further into the cosmos. That is a magnificent answer. I, I, for one, have never 
manage to see planes taking off as mundane. It still awes me that we yeah. have built these machines. Uh, and, and no matter how many times I fly on one, I still just pause for a moment as it's taking off and appreciate how safe and uh, functional it is. Uh, what are some of the first steps you think we will take into space? We have managed to build reusable rockets, so that presumably will take the cost of launches and decrease it dramatically. will make it far easier to move into space and maybe stay up there longer term or do simple kinds of manufacturing. What is it that you think will be the first couple of rungs of that ladder that we climb? Oh, um, that, that is a good question. I, I think the, the first rung of the ladder will be, you know, we've got reusable rockets to a certain level right now, but we still need to reduce costs. So if we want to do anything in space, if we want to build this this space future beyond the imagination, we've got to solve the problem of escaping Earth's gravity. You know, it's one of the reasons it took us until only, you know, four, five, five, six decades ago to actually get humans to space. So we've got reusable rocket technology, but it's still very expensive. So we need to lower the cost of access to space. We need better technology, better reusability, um, lighter weight materials, um, which can get humans to space, but don't require as much fuel because they're lighter weight. Because the, the rocket equation tells us that if you want to go further, you need more fuel, but then if you have more fuel, you need it's more heavier. fuel to launch that, and then you need right. more fuel to launch that. So it's all problems. So to me, the first rung on the ladder is really getting more and more people to space and reducing that cost, because we're not going to do anything else if we can't get more and more ideas and people to space. Do you think that is evolutionary or revolutionary? Like, do we mostly know what the path towards cheap space flight looks like, or do we need whole new materials, maybe something designed with a quantum computer that's a thousand times lighter than steel and a thousand times stronger, one of those sorts of things? I think we need both, actually, because the, the history of humanity has been about, yeah, it's been about evolution and revolution, if you look throughout history. And, and actually, if you look at reusable rockets, we've kind of gone back to similar designs that we saw in the 1960s in terms of a capsule on top of a rocket. You know, rockets at the moment don't look anything like the um, the space shuttle, which had so much promise, but didn't fulfill that promise that it tried to deliver. So. Yeah, we, we are seeing some sort of evolution of the original rocket, but when we need to see revolutions in terms of technology, I mean, if we want to go far. If we want to go really far, even to the, the depths of our solar system and, and perhaps one day beyond, which humans want to do, we need to work out how to go faster in space. You know, in many ways, we're just prisoners of our own um, Earth or our own solar system. If we want to go further, we want to explore further, we, we've got to get new forms of propulsion to get beyond Earth. So, that will involve a revolution, not an evolution. And if I had the answers to you right now, I'd be a very, very wealthy person. I'd be aboard one of those spaceships. So we, we, we need to see a bit of both. But, um, you know, humanity always, you know, engineering and, and the humanity's ability to solve hard problems is insatiable. We, we, we always find a way even when something seems impossible. And, you know, technology growth is exponential. So we're building on what we've learned over the past few decades to continue building and, and evolving in terms of what we can do. So I'm optimistic something will happen, but I don't know what that will be yet. So we need ever revolution, both. Yeah, we need an ever revolution, basically. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe I'm, I might work that into the title of this episode if I think that people <laughs> will understand I what like I mean. It. I, I like it. <laughs> um, so you host your podcast, right? Where's my jetpack? Yeah. Uh, I had some questions about that, but do you want to just sort of briefly explain what it is and what it's about and where that name comes from? Yeah, where's my jetpack? Is I think it's because it's the almost like the quintessential question that so many people have had about. Um, why they don't have jetpacks. You know, the jetpack was flown um, April 20th, um, 1961, for a matter of days after Yuri Gagarin became the first ever human being to go to space. The jetpack was flown for the first time, yet we don't have jetpacks. You know, humans still go to space. And it was one of those things that we were promised in the space age, but it never kind of happened. So I'm using that as a title to draw people in on this adventure to look at different types of space age contraptions, inventions, and to ask why we didn't get them, how, you know, how we've got to say what we've got today instead, and where we're heading in our space future and finishing up by asking, are these science fiction or science prediction? So it, is the jetpack something which is just invented by science fiction, kind of, we attempt to do it and it's never going to happen, or is it something real? Same with hoverboard, um, flying cars, uh, you, you name it, uh, visits to Mars, moon bases, space hotels. We look at all these kind of like space age-esque contraptions and ask, 
when will we get them or if we ever will get them. And and also what I like about it is it's kind of some surprising answers. So sometimes you think, oh, we haven't got jetpacks, but then you realize the technology could be used in other ways on Earth. Yeah, I have several follow ups to that. One thing I wanted to get okay, your go ahead. On, yeah, one one thing I wanted to get your opinion on is why that technology has stagnated. And this is a question that I've asked a number of different guests. It's a recurring theme on the show. We're, we're sort of interested in like the history and philosophy and sociology of science. But I love what that. is your yeah yeah what is your take on why that technology didn't develop? I think there is a general sense that after the Apollo landing and, and possibly with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we didn't have this existential threat anymore. And between that and maybe the growth of NASA's bureaucracy or a collapse in the, the will of the American people, it just didn't seem as urgent for us to continue down that path anymore. And it sort of sputtered out and, and became sort of sclerotic. And I don't know if that's really a fair characterization, but I, I, I do think it's fair to say that that perception exists pretty broadly. So what are the factors in your view that have driven a lack of progress in space exploration and related technologies? I think we've seen progress, but it's not in the way we expected. So it's about benefiting life on Earth and it's about utilizing the vantage points that satellites in orbit around Earth give us to improve quality of life on Earth. So it is that that subtle kind of space age that we didn't predict. But for me, it, it comes down to money. There was no business reason continue you know apollo was about two superpowers trying to do a big thing well you know the ussr and um, the united states and, and space was that big thing and you know kennedy set sights on the moon because they knew they couldn't beat the russians and all bit around earth and then when america won the space race they became you know the first nation to land on the moon there was no real reason to go back it was a, it was a cold war you know right. for all intents and purposes and that war we won way in, in many ways when Americans first landed on the moon and there was no real business reason to go. It was about politics. And so really the reason we haven't done many of those science fiction S things in space, you know, things we thought we had by now is because A, the technology isn't there. We've learned to live and work in space. The, the, the trips to the moon with Apollo were less than two weeks. You know, now we have astronauts living on board the International Space Station for up to a year at a time in some cases. And, and secondly, there was no business case for that. There was no real motive to just explore for exploration's sake. Is it? You know, as much as humans are curious and humans want to, to go over that hill and see what else is out there, unless you can get the funds to, to develop that technology, it's not going to happen. But this is why now is the time, because the, the revolution in terms of cyberspace and, and people who made a lot of money in cyberspace, they were the people who were inspired by Apollo, the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musk. They were kids of the space age, they've made their money in the internet, and now they're utilizing their funds to actually, you know, there's many other players, it's not just about billionaires in the commercial space sector, it's about people from all walks of life, but they're utilizing their funds to um, to solve those hard problems and, and to, to lay that kind of like pathway to enable our children to build the future in space, so to, to you know, try and crack the problem and get into space and reducing the cost of access to space. So the reason we haven't been back to the moon, we haven't got space hotels yet, uh, you know, and we will go back to the moon and we will get space hotels, but the reason we haven't got them yet really comes down to, to money. There was no business case to do it. And what we're going to see now is a shift and, and government couldn't take risk, particularly with public money, in the same way that private industry can take risk with their own money, you know, in, right. in the opposite way. So it's it's going to happen, but we've just got the timing wrong. This is related to a question I asked earlier, but if it's true that now is the time to expand into space, what's the business case? What, what is it that was missing before? I mean, th th there were spectacularly wealthy people in the 60s. So what's different about the conditions now such that it makes sense for Bezos and Musk and Sir Richard Branson to be pouring billions of dollars into these inchoate space enterprises? What, what, what do you think they're going to, how, how do you think they're going to recoup their costs, I guess? Well, space has got, the you know, the first trillionaire, will come from the space industry. It will likely be from utilizing space-based data for use on Earth. But space has you know, got the potential over the next few decades to become a, a trillion-dollar industry, that there is so much money to be made in space. And it goes back to thinking of space not as a place to go anymore, but an extension of life on Earth. So it's almost, you know, the best way to think about it is it's almost like the new Wild West. The reason it couldn't happen right. back in the 1960s is because Space, you had to be a gazillionaire. You had to have the wealth of a nation, a superpower, not just any nation, a superpower to be able to access space. It was unaffordable. The technology was so new and so risky. But because we've 
done more and more in space because we've learned to live and work in space. The cost of access to space has actually come down. And if you were to get a map of the world and color in for, you know, every nation on Earth that had a space-based asset, be that a satellite or contribution to a space station or whatever, you color in nearly every single country on Earth. The space is no longer about trillionaires. It's now about billionaires. And then if you want to go as a tourist, it's about millionaires. So the cost of access to space has come down. It's still beyond the realms of everyday people right now, but we're seeing a, a reduction in the cost of access to space. And that is why now is the time for people like Jeff Bezos, you know, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, people like that. And, and what do they get back from it? They Sometimes people don't have to get things back. These are people who are obviously very smart people. They've made a lot of money in their lives, but it's about building the future. You know, I've worked with Jeff Bezos, and, and one thing he um, said when I worked with him is, you know, he wants to reduce the cost of access to launch so that anyone, a, a kid in a dorm room can come up with an idea and get that idea to space, not himself going, but the idea in space in the same way that he and many others were able to utilize the internet pretty much for free in their dorm rooms or their basements or whatever to create billion dollar companies that you hadn't even heard of yet. So by reducing the cost of access to launch, you're opening up an opportunity to create the future, to create companies we can't even imagine yet, much in the same way that the internet did that in the 1990s. If you were to go back 30 years ago and name the most profitable companies we have here in, in the world in 2022, most of them wouldn't have existed. So it's about doing the same. It's about this this new platform, this new way of making money in the, in the same way the internet could be looked at 30 years ago. So Jeff Bezos wants to bring the costs of launch and access to space down enough so that there can be an Amazon in space? No, there, there, there can be opportunities to create companies that we haven't imagined yet. So we can get ideas to space, payloads to space, and um, satellites to space. And um, you know, much of what we watch, even look at science missions, for example. NASA's looked at, or oh, NASA's announced today its next round of um, science missions that will do to, to other worlds within our solar system. Most of these don't get funded. Very little science in space, you know, from conception to actually becoming a, a spacecraft or a, a robotic explorer for another world, actually succeeds. But the, the more we can access space, the more we can reduce that cost down, the more science we can do, the more technology we can develop, the more we can, you know, create things we can't even imagine yet in the same way that we couldn't imagine all the companies we have right now 20, 30 years ago. What are some of the projects in that vein that get you really excited? Oh my gosh, I, I think so much for me, the, the idea of um, manufacturing in space. So the idea of yep. doing a lot of the, the heavy lifting that we do on Earth, but in space. I mean, it's important to remember that when we talk about space exploration, it's not about destroying Earth and then going up to destroy other planets or, or you right. know carving up some <laughs> other worlds. It's about recognizing that, that Earth is the best planet. It's the only place that not only sustains us, but enables us to thrive as a species. And if we're we need to look after planet Earth. So by doing things such as manufacturing in space, we're, we're doing something which is quite bad for the Earth and we're taking it away from Earth and we're looking at doing it in space. So much of what we do is about protecting Earth. You know, NASA has a, a whole department, a whole, you know, institute, research institute, looking at climate science and how we utilise the vantage point of space to make critical decisions about how we tackle huge problems that our planet faces because in order to make those decisions we need as much information as possible in order to um make decisions about disaster relief or um you know, earthquake relief or, or you name it we need that extra vantage point so for me what excites me most is things like manufacturing and earth observation and using the vantage point of space to look after planet earth because 99 percent of what we do in space is about earth that's a very interesting perspective i'd never thought of it in quite that way. Can you walk me through how you see manufacturing in space unfolding? Because this is something I keep coming back to periodically. And I, I think about how much cost there is involved in getting it up there and what you can do once it's there that would be worth paying that cost. Certain kinds of materials are just easier to work with in low Earth orbit. So what are some of the sectors of manufacturing you think would be sensible to do in space and, and pay that cost? Keep bearing in mind that the cost will go down, of course, but still. Seeing as, seeing as we're talking about the future here and, and big picture stuff and looking at where we want to be, I think it's best to kind of like start the finish line with where we want to be in terms of manufacturing in space and then work our way back. Um, the long-term vision for manufacturing in space is to arrive 
at another world. And by world, I mean this could be a moon elsewhere in our solar system or perhaps one day even further away and, and to, to live off the land to no longer rely on Earth, but be, to be able to manufacture everything you need from that new world you arrive in. So additive manufacturing or 3D printing, if you prefer, you know, going to a new world, being able to create habitats, being able to create everything you need, being able to create medical supplies, medical, you know, all good, you, you name it, being able to create that in space and not actually rely on Earth. So that's a longer term picture to you no longer rely on Earth, to live off the land exactly the same as what we've done when we explored Earth. When people, um, when the Mayflower <laughs> sailed, for example, to uh, America, they didn't take everything they needed with them. They lived off the land, and that's exactly what we need to do in space. We need to be independent of Earth at some point in order to succeed in becoming, and this is kind of a, an industry term which just gets battered around and sounds kind of science fictiony, but in becoming a multi-planetary species. So that's a longer-term goal. Um, and, and to look at the short term, it's, you know, the most recent short term is um, actually getting things to space because it's so expensive to get to space. So if we could manufacture satellites in orbit instead of having to, to launch them from Earth, if we could manufacture habitat in orbit, perhaps one day on the moon, perhaps one day on Mars, it reduces the cost of having to launch something from Earth into space. So it's about reducing costs and reducing reliance on Earth. And, and you know, all astronauts in space right now, well, the International Space Station, they rely on Earth, they, they rely on resupply ships, but that needs to change if we're to actually extend our presence in space. Yeah, that's that's very compelling. So I had originally asked the question thinking, like we'd be looking at 10 or 15 years out building something in space, but your inclination is to go further out than that and say, if we're going to succeed in becoming an, a multi-planetary species, we need some way of living off the land as it were. And that's probably yeah. going to involve advanced forms of manufacturing. What kind of timeline would you put to something like that? So that's an impossible question. I, I feel like <laughs> some, some, some of the stuff that's happening now, so um, there's already a 3D printer on the International Space Station. They've been able okay. to. There's a great story that an astronaut during a spacewalk, um, this is roughly about five or six years ago now, I think, lost his ratchet during a spacewalk. I mean, you know, I've never done a spacewalk. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you listening haven't done a spacewalk, but it, it sounds like something quite easy to do when you're in a microgravity environment right. to accidentally drop your ratchet. <laughs> and normally in that case, you'd have to rely on a ratchet coming up, a new ratchet, a replacement one. So I can't imagine they've got many knocking around on the International Space Station space. And you'd have to rely on a resupply emission from Earth. But a company at the time known as Made in Space, which now merged with red virus space, we're actually able to, using this um, 3D printer on the um, space station, print, manufacture a, a new ratchet for the, this astronaut built to warm off on the space station. So his ratchet was no longer locked. So we're already seeing manufacturing on a very simple level happening in space. So it's, it's happening now. We're, we're already building things in space. We're already creating things in space. You know, habitats, there's a habitat on the International Space Station, attached to the International Space Station, known as BEAM. And this is an expandable habitat, almost like a, a pop-up tent is probably the best analogy. So it's folded up, the launch is very lightweight, and then you expand it once you're in space. It might not be directly manufacturing, but it's still something which is expanded, you know, and changed right. when it's in space. So it's already happening. I mean, the International Space Station was built in orbit. All the modules were launched separately and then, then put together by astronauts in orbit. Um, so it's already happening now. But in terms of where we go next, I mean, it's just going to continue exponentially because as costs come down and there's more investment in the space industry, that gives the opportunity for more entrepreneurs and more ideas and, and more science to actually improve the way we manufacture in space. Fantastic. And talk to me a little bit about space tourism. So we recently interviewed John Spencer, who's this longtime advocate for the space experience economy. And he has spent a prodigious amount of time thinking about things like how you would build a hot tub in space, which just sounds... <laughs> wow. <laughs> he walked me through it. And I don't recall the details, but it's four or five episodes back. Yeah, He walks me through how you'd make it and it would be like a sphere and you'd kind of be submerged in the sphere. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Yeah, I'm terrified. Yeah. M m yeah amazing and terrifying maybe that's not the first uh thing that we go for but what what do you think the the market for space tourism is going to be like what do you think people will do up there uh in a space hotel you know i mean many things become much more complicated in in uh 
in, in no gravity. Like gambling, for example, is, it's quite difficult to throw dice if, if uh, they just sort of float away. So w what do you think people will be doing? What, what kind of guesses do you have about the timeline? What would you want to do in space? Just riff with that question in any way that you'd like. Well, what would people be doing in space? They'd be looking out the window. They would be looking back at Earth. You know, uh, to go back to my earlier comment, you know, the one thing we have in common with all our ancestors is that we've looked up at the stars. But those who go to space have the, the rare privilege to, to no longer just look up, but to look back and have that unique vantage point of Earth. So my gravity is great, but you can recreate that on Earth. You can take a, a flight on the vomit comet, but to be in space and to be able to look back at Earth, that's what people will be doing when you talk to to astronauts you know we're on 610 i think astronauts who've now been to space roughly that number um and the one thing which changes them is the impact of seeing the earth and space seeing that fragile blue line i was at um, a good friend of mine um it, he went to space as a space passenger uh, you know a space flight participant with blue origin back in um december i was there for his space flight his name's dylan taylor and when he landed back to earth i was there for capsule recovery and he was awestruck. He, he literally looked like he'd been like, it seemed like a shocking event because he was able to see the Earth for those 15 minutes he was in space and it changed him. And that's what space tourism is about. It's about a new perspective. It's about seeing something that so few have been able to do. Um, so that's why people want to go to space. In terms of the market for it, we're going to see, like everything, costs come down. You know, unfortunately, it's for the rich, first of all, but there's also initiatives such as Space and Humanity that I work with, which is um, helping to send people from all kinds of backgrounds to space. Because if we're going to succeed in space, there's often a comparison with aviation back in the 1940s or 50s and saying the rich went first and then, you know, the cost decreased. Right, but if right. we're really going to succeed, you know, that comparison needs to stop. And we need to send people from all kinds of backgrounds because they can go back to their community and talk about that experience seeing the earth in a new way you know there's a term for it known as the the overview effect that transformative effect and they can go back to their community and, and communicate with them in a way that a rich white american astronaut might not be able to do so if we get diversity people from all kinds of backgrounds experiencing that that's going to help people understand why we go to space and, and understand why these, these tourist trips matter and, and then secondly looking at the the longer term picture and you mentioned the the hot tub in space which i think sounds terrifying and amazing <laughs> You know, space gives us a, a clean slate. It gives us a clean slate to create new musical instruments, which can only be played in space, to create experiences in space that can only be done in space. You know, it's a completely new vantage point. So it gives us so much opportunity for design, for imagination, for architecture, for art, for creativity, all of the things which make up the human experience. It's a new playing field. So it gives us so many opportunities. People aren't going to just take one tourist trip. They're going to want to go for more. The same way you don't just take one holiday in your lifetime. It's just a new vantage point. So that, for me, is what's so exciting. And I hope we get to see more people from more backgrounds going to space and then communicating that to people that they can relate to. Because how would you feel if your neighbor went to space? <laughs> you know, Joe, Joe, John, John Smith lives down the street and he suddenly went to space. That would make space something which seemed really unrelatable suddenly more relatable because your neighbor went to space and, and, and you know he, he can then right. talk to you or she then talk to you about it so it's all about making that experience more relatable but in the long term it's about that clean state and that that way to imagine a new human experience which is so exciting i'm reminded of that famous passage from carl sagan's book contact where the I, astronauts maybe isn't the right word but the, the long-term inhabitants of low earth orbit gradually completely reconceptualize how they imagine the earth, right? They, they look down on it day after day and they don't see any country lines. They don't see any borders or any boundaries. And over time, it becomes much, much harder for them not to just see the world as a place, right? Not a place divided up uh, along these, you know, largely artificial boundaries, but just one whole place populated by an entire human population. And yeah, I didn't really have a follow-up to that. It just, it reminds me of that, and it's put really beautifully in that book. I, do you know, I've not, I, I'm a big fan of Sagan, but, but I have read that exact excerpt. But I, I, I do feel like, yeah, one of the, the main things to come from those who've been to space is, is that cliche that they see no borders. And um, one thing, I've done work with SETI, and uh, I've done episodes of my podcast, uh, Where's My Jetpack, um, looking at life beyond Earth. And one question you have to ask is that, uh, 
we were to hypothetically make contact with an alien species, mm -hmm. who would represent Earth? Because on Earth, we're divided by borders and territories and countries and conflicts. But in, in space, to an alien, we're all Earthlings. We all call the same planet home. We're not as um, different as we think we are. So yeah, how would we have that unified message to represent Earth and communicate to a hypothetical alien species. I, I don't think we've actually got it within us right now, but I, my hope is that, that space will, and, and you look at, for example, the International Space Station, 16 nations came together to, to build the International Space Station. Countries such as Russia and America, one which have conflicts, you know, political conflict or disagreement back on Earth. You've got Germany and England, for example, you know, look at World War II. And you've got right. countries which might not always get on together on Earth, working together in space. And my hope is that the more we do in space, the more I realize that space exploration is bigger than any one company, country or individual. And it requires humanity working together. And, and that will help in that sense of that we're all in this together once we leave space. Because we, you know, when you're on the moon looking back, you don't call your particular hometown home, you call Earth home because Earth is your home. So I hope um, the more people we go to space, the more we realize that we're all in this together. And I would love to send politicians up there or, or you know, the next um, <laughs> COP26 or whatever it's called, climate meeting to be done in space to realize that we're all in this together and to realize how fragile our planet is. Do they have to come back, the politicians that we send up? Can they just stay? Oh, yeah. would you want them in space if you were going to go? Well, yeah, fair enough. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of space. I, I feel like I could probably find somewhere to go where the politicians wouldn't bother me too much, but maybe that's just too much <laughs> optimism on my part. Um, yeah, that dovetails that dovetails nicely with a another question I wanted to ask you about the benefits of space. And obviously, we've kind of been talking about them this whole time, but one of the benefits of space is the shift in perspective. And earlier, you alluded to this exact question that people sometimes have. Uh, Namely, what is the point in, in investing in space exploration when there are so many problems here on Earth? So there, there are a number of famous responses to this. I just wanted to, to give you a chance to take a crack at it. Like, why worry about the stars when there's so much here that needs to be fixed? Well, I think I've mentioned this quite a lot in this, so I, so I hope I don't repeat myself too much. But it's, you have to get that new perspective. Space exploration, right. the majority of what we do is about benefiting life on Earth. We all carry a space receiver in our pocket. We could not have everything in banking transactions. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I live in America, but I'm originally from England, as you can tell from the accent. So, you know, putting the kettle on for a, for a pot of tea, using the electricity grid, it all involves space technology. We are already living in the space age. Space improves our life. We could not have a day without space-based technology. So the space age is here. We need space. Space has improved our lives. It improved the lives of people across the planet, you know, we're living, it doesn't always feel like it, but we are living in the best time in terms of technology and innovation. And the more we invest in space-based technology, the more benefits we can bring back to Earth. You know, I've said this a few times, but what we do in space is about Earth. It's about improving life on Earth for every single person. But then at the same time, it's about pushing the boundaries, you know, just that little slither, pushing the boundaries of where we can go and what we can do, because humans were built to explore. Humans were built to wonder what is over that next hill and then to go there. It's what differentiates from pretty much every other species we share this planet with to, to not explore, to not push the boundaries of where we can go and what we could do. It, it wouldn't be humans. If humans are always going to continue to explore. It's going to, and, and in doing so, we inspire the next generation or we bring about new technology, new innovations, new discoveries that we cannot even imagine yet. Yeah, to explore as human. I, I like that thought. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to think that this perspective ends up being very short-sighted. So when people say, what's the point in investing in space? I mean, they forget that in order to do that, you have to push the boundaries of dozens and dozens of different scientific fields, which inevitably, because of the interconnected nature of human knowledge, redounds to the benefit of many other fields. If we figure out how to grow you know, carrots off world, I mean, that inevitably is going to mean that we're better at, at growing carrots on earth and, and ditto for medicines in space and ditto for manufacturing in space. And that's not even counting just better radar systems or better telecommunication systems or satellites that are down less often or internet that's accessible in rural parts of Uganda. So I, I'm a hundred percent on board as far as the long-term benefits of investing in space. I, I think we totally agree on that. Yeah. You know, space, Space is about us. And, and then just taking the example of medicine, for, for example, um, cancer research can be done in space. The way that a cell grows in the microgravity environment replicates exactly how a cell grows in the body. And by doing research into cancer drugs and other medical you know, 
drugs in space, we can treat diseases better on Earth. We can work out how better to use medication to improve life, to improve health here on Earth. So much medical research is done on space by astronauts. Sometimes they're almost effectively human guinea pigs when they're aboard the space station, which brings real life benefit to, to people here on Earth. Uh, and there was this story I heard and I wrote about it in my, my latest book, Look Up Our Story with the Stars, about how the, the Columbia um, tragedy back in 2003, where the space shuttle was lost during re-entry, one of the experiments they had been doing during their time in space, uh, less than two weeks of being in space, but one of the experiments was a cancer research a- experiment in, into the way that cells grow in microgravity, and that experiment actually survived. You know, when the astronauts didn't survive it, that survived re-entry, and, and some of that data was still being able to be used. You, you think of certainly working astronauts as it sounds like a fun job, but, but you know, space is still risky. It seems like you know going to space happens all the time right now, but it's a hugely risky thing to do. And, and astronauts know the risk. Career astronauts, NASA astronauts know the risk better than anyone, but they're willing to risk their lives for space exploration because what they're doing in space in terms of pushing the foundations of where humans can go and what humans can do, but also the science they're doing in space to improve lives for so many on Earth is worth the risk for their life. And if that's not, you know, an example for how much space matters, the fact that people are literally willing to not only dedicate their lives to working in the space industry, but risk their lives and, and in some cases pay the ultimate price shows you how important space is, why it matters so much, why going there matters so much for every single person on Earth. It's a fantastic answer. These are great answers. You should start a podcast. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I'll consider it. You have beautifully made the case for expansion and exploration of space and and have even said that a desire to explore our surroundings and push boundaries is part of what it is to be human. Now, in this process of exploring space, do you think we'll find anything else out there, any intelligent life or any alien life whatsoever? Um, there's lots of different ways you can kind of approach that question, the Fermi paradox and, and related sort of philosophical questions. So how do you think about that? And what are your ultimate conclusions? I mean, alien life could have found us already and just passed us by in the same way that you wouldn't stop and try and talk to some ants in the street because you just don't think you can even communicate with them exactly the same could have happened to us. We, we just don't know. We, could, you know, and I hope we're not, but we could be the only intelligent civilization in this vast universe, or we could be so backward compared to what else is out there. We're only just beginning to scratch the surface of what else is out there. And, you know, to say, are we alone or not in the universe right now would be faith and not science. But my hope is that certainly within the next few decades, that we'll be able to answer that question, are we alone? The most likely answer will come from within our own solar system, likely microbial life, very simple life on the planet Mars. We know that Mars in the past was much warmer and wetter, so it may have had the conditions for life. It may still have the conditions for very simple microbial life or elsewhere within our solar system, places such as Enceladus and Europa, which are these um, moons of um, the planets uh, Jupiter and Saturn, which basically have these icy surfaces with possible liquid oceans underneath. And we know to have life, you need basically three things, raw material, as well to have it, an energy source, in that case, the gas giants at the orbit and the tidal force of that, and, and thirdly, water. And we believe in Saladus and Europa both to have um, highly probable liquid oceans underneath their surfaces. So we will likely, hopefully, answer that question of whether we're alone or not in the universe within the next few decades as the scientific missions expand into our solar system. You know, a new mission for Enceladus was announced uh, just today. You know, we're recording this on April 19th. We've had um, we've got missions going to Europa and Perseverance right now has got a, um, a mission aimed for looking for evidence of where ancient alien microbial life might have existed. So the next question comes is if we do find life beyond Earth, elsewhere within our solar system, is that life independent of Earth or is that life something which is related to Earth? You know, there is a hypothesis that all life on Earth could have actually been seeded by a Martian meteorite during the, the uh, yeah, during the early uh, formation of the solar system. So are we the Martians we're looking for? But if that life elsewhere in our solar system is independent of life on Earth, that means two genesises within our one very average solar system. And we know pretty much every star you see when you look at the night sky, there's at least one planet orbiting around it. So you can just begin to extrapolate then. But then the next question becomes, is there intelligent life? Uh, and we, we, we just don't know. We can imagine, we can dream, we can wonder, but as always, it will be something beyond the imagination. 
I, I have no doubt that you've heard of the great filter. Yeah. So do you, do you put any credence in that idea that there's actually a fact to be explained insofar as we have so far not found any evidence of intelligent life? Like when you, when you look up at the night sky, you see all these stars and you know that each one, you know, is, is either a single star or it's a galaxy and there's millions of other stars and each one has planets. And, and just by sheer probability, you would expect there to have been many, many, not, not just independent instances of life evolving, but possibly even a civilization level, technological civilization level, um, evolution. And, and yet we don't hear radio waves. We don't hear any of those things. And I, I'm just not entirely sure that I'm convinced by that because space is huge and we haven't been looking that long and we're not even looking in that many bandwidths, uh, or, or along very, all these different spectra. But do you think there's anything to that or is it just kind of an argument that's too clever by half? I think it's a thought. I think the first thing is that we're very young in terms of the age of the universe. As a technological civilization, we're little more than 100 years old. We are a very young civilization. And secondly, it goes down to human arrogance to think that we're so important that alien life might find us or that we will very easily find it. You know, we're just a speck in the ocean. We don't know what else is out there and, and whether we are that important, whether we are that, you know, that much interest to an alien civilization. So, you know, if we were to condense the entire universe down into the oceans on Earth, we've probably um, searched, well, we've searched around a pint glass full. So just scoop out a pint glass full of ocean water and tell me what you know about the ocean based on that pint glass of water. You, you know nothing. And, and that's the same thing. We have barely begun to understand what else is out there. So the idea that um, we would know everything or that we, you know, that we'd know what might happen to intelligent civilization is just that. It's just an idea. We, we do not have the answers yet. We have barely left our own cosmic backyard. We're still sat on our porch trying to understand what else is out there in this big city we, we call the cosmos. And we don't know yet. We, 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 we have only just beginning but you know we're the ones alive at a time witnessing humans taking their first step in steps into the universe and beginning to answer those questions but we, we just don't know anything any attempt to answer this is, is just faith as i said and it's just ideas right now that's that's very well put and i tend to agree i uh, in the closing minutes here i want to bring the conversation back to where it began you noted at the at the top of the episode that it's nearly impossible to look up at the night sky and not be filled with questions such as the meaning of life and what the purpose of our existence is. And so I wanted to ask you those questions. What, what in your view is the meaning of life and the purpose of existence? Oh, those are, those are great, very profound questions. <laughs> finish on. I, I guess, you know, the meaning of life, I, I, the cliche answer would be to procreate because that procreates because that's what <laughs> humans and all species do. But I, I think the meaning of life is to, to explore uh, and to be happy and, and to be curious. And, uh, you know, curiosity is the essence of human existence. Humans were built, built to explore. Uh, and so the inter my interpretation of meaning of life, for humans at least, is to explore and, and to ask questions and to wonder. It's almost the curse of being human that we, we wonder what else is out there, what happens next, what our story is, uh, and we can't just exist in the moment. So for me, you know, that that's what it is be human and in terms of the and um, what was the second part of that question what what sort of what's the purpose of life so the meaning and the purpose of life i, I guess it's just two different ways of expressing it's the same thing it's the same thing i i think for humans um it's to to ask questions and to explore it is and to be curious is that that is the essence of what it is to be human so what are the the next chapters for you what are you exploring what are you curious about well, I'm exploring my new home country. I've recently emigrated to America, which is very exciting. Welcome, to, um, welcome. How, how do you how do you find you. the uh, the waving uh, the amber waves of grain? How do you find all that? The amber waves of grain is an American thing. I, I don't understand yet. <laughs> oh, it's part of our um, our national anthem. Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> this is this is terrible. This. So I'll be I'll be terrible American. You gotta go shortly. back. You gotta go back. Take yeah. your tea and go I'll back. Be, uh, take my tea. Yes, <laughs> throw it in the ocean. I'm 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 loving being in America. To me, um, one of the reasons I, I've always wanted to be an American since I was a little girl is that you know to explore, to take risks. To, to open up new frontiers is, is so much of what it means to be an American there and to push those boundaries. I mean, America has changed the face of human exploration in terms of modern human exploration, in terms of pushing the frontiers of space exploration. I work in the space industry and to be here is the, 
you know, the greatest privilege of my life, be, you know, and to play that, that small kind of um, part in, in the tale of humanity's reaching beyond Earth into space is, is something you can only really, really do in a great way in America. I mean, lots of other countries do it well, but America, you're just leading the way. And so it's, it's just a huge honor to play my tiny part in that story of humans exploring beyond Earth. So, yeah, I, I'm loving it. And working on i've just had obviously my podcast out um i've got a new book coming out in uh june uh, which i can't talk about much yet um, i've got a podcast obviously uh Jet, where's my jetpack um look up my uh, after Over the stars um which was released in the uk in 2020 has just launched in america and i've also just finished a, a tv show in the uk so lots going on and lots of other projects i'm not allowed to talk about as well quite quite busy aren't you yeah, I like being busy. I, I do too. I, I find that some of my favorite people are Americans by choice, people who weren't born here, but who either gravitated or discovered the ideas later and made the effort to pay the cost to to come and be here as an expression of their loyalty to those ideas. And I think that perhaps unique in American history or unique in world history, America is a country built around ideas. And so some of the best yeah. Americans are ones are, are people that found those ideas somewhere else and came here in order to live those out. So welcome. And I hope you accomplish everything you Thank want to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. America to me, it, it's difficult to emigrate. It's not an easy thing to it's do. Not. Even mm-hmm. as someone who travel as myself, but I, I think you really hit the nail on the head. America was built on an idea and it's just the opportunity you have in this country is a privilege. Are there any ideas or any thoughts you want to leave us with in the last minutes here? Just to to keep looking up and to keep asking questions about what else is out there and to remember that when you look up at the night sky on a clear night and you look at, see one of those stars, there could be someone or something on a planet orbiting one of those stars looking up and seeing our, star like a, our sun like a star in their night sky and wondering what else is out there. It's a magnificent note to end on. Sarah, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.